Hello, everybody. <sighs> I had a little bit of a panic getting this set up at the last minute. Um, turns out that you can't just tell YouTube that you would like to go do a stream and plug your webcam in and then just hit go. There's like other softwares that have to be installed and special codes that have to be programmed and entered and all these different settings that have to be toggled. But all in all, things have gone as well as I think they could, and we are now here. So definitely not going to call foul yet, but I'm waiting for my little test screen to show me. Let's see here. I just want to make sure I'm getting audio. Oh, that's some ugly audio, though. Let's see here. Hopefully that will be a little more pleasant, where I won't be burning out the mic every two seconds. Um, yes. <laughs> anyway, social distancing. Everybody's stuck at home. Should be sitting in a nice warm cafe, enjoying alcoholic beverages and yummy food with a bunch of smiling faces, while someone awkwardly poses in the middle deciding whether or not uh, the vibe is comfy enough where they can actually talk and be themselves, or whether they just have to be a statue unless they uh, offend those involved. I have a very full cup of coffee. I have a bottle of wine in backup just in case. Hopefully you are in equally comfortable setting. Let me see if I can... Is there a chat? Is there no live chat? I feel like there should be a live chat. How do I view the live chat live? I need to push that. Nope. Um, where is live chat cat? Well, that's weird. Cannot seem to figure out how to view live chat on my device here. But it might be because the device I'm viewing through is not actually one set up for uh, YouTube. So, and of course, didn't mute that phone. Ah, give me another moment or two while I get settled, and hopefully you're still getting settled and you're not too annoyed with me. But, um, we will be going through a few simple concepts. Um, framing an image while trying to capture a model. Granted, so I have, um, instead of having a subject, I have pulled uh, one of the old magazines that has been sent here to a former tenant as junk mail, and I will be using these as my point of reference. So feel free to uh, follow along with the images that you uh, see me using, or if you want, you can pull up in excuse me, Instagram or use your own magazines. But hopefully we will give you some skills to improve your own confidence where uh, artistic practice comes to mind. So if you ever go to a figure drawing thing, you'll be a little bit more, um, you'll feel like you belong there as opposed to the vibe they constantly give off, which is that you shouldn't. And I always find annoying. <laughs> See, go to my channel, go to the live video playing right now with a whole three people watching where I can see the edge of my phone. Hello, Sean Polrace. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but, uh... oh, and Leah, of course you're there. I don't know why I would have even doubted. Leah, can you, because I know you'll at least know what quality level I'm going for, or at least understand that this is a slapdash setup and that there's a limitation to what I can do, and I'm just dropping things now. Um, actually, anyway, and anyone tell me if the volume speech patterns, if they're acceptable to quiet, uh, if they're going into the red, I cannot see because the um, actual uh, software I'm using to stream is behind me at a whole other desk. And I have one cable that's running across that has almost tripped me twice. I don't even know why I'm sharpening the white pencil, but it goes with the other two, so I am. I also keep like looking at the little screen of me and wondering why uh, I'm not seeing exactly what I'm doing. Like, I'll move my hand in the way, and it's not coming up. So I'm just going to pause that visual so I'm not getting distracted and thinking it's real. <sighs> All right. So 
a few things that we're going to cover. Um, we're going to cover the skeletal versus the negative space approaches to figure drawing. We're going to try to cover a few uh, muscle memory exercises to improve your own ability to make certain shapes on demand. And we will um, also just go over like a little bit of basic anatomy, not a ton. And because we're working with um, editorial photos of people who have clothes on, we will probably do a little bit of framing where, uh, not framing, um, texture concerns of like how to just quickly block out um, fabric textures so that you're not spending all your time trying to like pin down details. The other thing is that because we are running this like a version of a uh, Crash Course 4, where the hell's my other phone? A Crash Course 4 figure drawing, I will have a timer running for when I actually do these things so you can see that it is possible to execute certain techniques in a certain time frame. Oh, and I'll also teach you how to get faster. That's the other big thing. So some of the first ones we will do will just be three minutes. So I'm going to have that little buddy right there. <clears throat> but first things first, this is just a technique that I drill into anyone's head when I'm trying to teach them anything illustrative. This is what we call a riverbed technique, and it is strictly to... Um, Teach your hands to make repetitive motions in a way that is uh, simple and doesn't eat up too much time or get too boring. I should probably be pressing down harder. That's the whole point why I'm using charcoal instead of pencil. But a little loud roughness. Okay, let's see. Check. Nope, a little more, because if you can hear me that well from over there, that's probably not good. One, two, okay. Uh, facing away, it was in the middle of the green. Hopefully, now I should be near the top of the green. So if you still hear some uh, rough backlash, let me know. Uh, we'll, we'll edit this all in post. Thank God we're not live. Wait, what? Anyway. <laughs> um, so, you just make a quick box and break it up into a few quick little sections. Um, actually, you know what? I do want to keep the video running now that I'm looking at this. Oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah, okay, good. So then I'm just gonna go in and in one of the segmented areas, I'm going to do circles. The goal is to fill it up with as many circles at different sizes, ideally all of them being fairly round. Usually you'll notice that um, your roundness is bad at the start and no matter what, like even at the start of a session of doing this. So my roundness is a little rough because my hand is a little rough. This is what makes this a good warm up exercise as well. Um, but you're just putting circles in and trying to get them close to touching each other without actually touching each other. Then you do the same thing with, uh, you can do, so you can do any type of pattern really, but um, I'm going to do zigzags here. And the goal here again is to just put more zigzags right next to it. Ideally, you're going for duplicates. Um, you could also, if you just want to get simple, you know, get better cross hatching, just going down and making very controlled lines that don't bleed over the borders. And lastly, uh, the other one I really like to do is just some simple curves because they are frustrating as heck. And making the curve that you're trying to make is very tough sometimes. Changing direction so that you get you know, you can't just do it all the way across. It would never work. And now I've entirely lost it on that one. But I usually do four or five for each direction and then change to something else. But yeah, fill the whole thing up with that as a practice whenever you get the chance. It's good for you. It helps your hand. It helps your muscle memory. It helps your line confidence. All in all, it should be a win for everybody. Uh, second. Now we shall get 
to doing a little bit of uh, actual drawing. A uh, quick look over my shoulder so I can make sure that this is all in frame, and it is. So, I have a very simple uh, pose here. Legs up, mug and lap, not that complicated. So the goal at any point when you're trying to um, do any sort of figure drawing is that you want to capture the figure of the person in as few moves as possible. You can build up towards detail as you go, but you don't want to start, like, I know some people who would look at this and without having, like, if they had an art education background, or have been educated, at, and they slowly start to try to, like, build out the image of the person, not really, like, thinking in terms of speed or big picture, because when you're being taught illustrative techniques, most of the time, you are simply being given a one-to-one -to -one toolbox of take as much time as you need, you'll get there. And while that is functional, it doesn't work the same way for figure drawing. Like if I start this way, I've already probably lost about 15 to 20 seconds, and I've barely captured any of the person at all. And most of these details aren't what I should be trying to focus on. So, the... Uh, main option that most people who have done any sort of uh, art education will try for. Actually, this may even be an instinctive approach, but there are people who will just sort of try to grab a skeletal representation of the figure building out each limb as you go. Some might do even in more bare bones where they're really just like hitting these big sweeping like box frame sort of things where it's like, hey, here's the key locations, neck, here's some spine, arm down, and then they will build up as they go. Other people, myself being one of these, will prefer to use what is called the negative space tactic where you're really just kind of looking at this and so I can see the model is in a certain area, and usually, if you're doing this live, you would try to frame up the room and look for, like, key spots in the room. Um, at Trident, where we would normally be doing this, there's some uh, corners, a TV in the background, there's a few posts, um, the way windows and seats are lined up are sometimes useful. But here, she's in a window. So I am thinking in terms of negative space, and will sort of just about figure out where the negative and positive space lie. Not trying to get into too many details to start. So option A versus option B. Now what I will be doing here is doing a bit of a fusion of these tactics. For your benefit. Um, I also wonder if I can get the light to be a little bit less intense. So we get less glare and hopefully better visibility. I'm going to give that a second. Actually, let me get the sketch paper out. Um, is anyone watching? Do you have any questions at the moment? Anything that you need clarified before I move on? Because we're about 15 minutes in, and that's usually about how much time I allow for a uh, crash course at uh, the actual live drawing events, where I usually do a quick show and tell. But we will obviously be going into more detail here. So feel free to posit a query if you have anything that you are confused about. The audio is still a little bit like rattly, but I think that's because it's just a catch-all microphone. Um, this microphone was not made for me talking not with my face pointed at it, so it's catching the energy, uh, the sound waves very oddly. But it sounds clear enough, just a little bit rattly, which is unfortunate. If I do more of these in the future, I will set up uh, more professional sounding tools. Okay, I think the lighting is a little bit better. Uh, also, hopefully, on a larger screen, this looks much better, but that is future problems. 
uh, what lead of pencil are you using? So for this, I'm actually using a, um, it's a silk charcoal. It is a number four, but that's because I'm trying to get these darker lines to show up. Because if I was using a standard two pencil, which is my usual, um, there's some quick swirl with that bad boy. And here's the same thing with this bad boy. And you'll clearly note that uh, the standard graphite doesn't show up as well. But if you're just doing quick sketches, I've never found the uh, two, the standard tube pencil um, to be a problem. Um, if I was working on thumbnails or anything for a more professional end game where I do de plan to develop the sketch, I'm probably going to do multiple renderings of it. I want to be able to draw over it with a darker pencil without much fight. I will use an F, which is pretty much the middle ground between the soft and hard leads. Um, and those are my preferred. But I would try to, uh, if you have the art supply store available to you in a future where you can actually go in and uh, experiment with some pencils, I would just, like, get one of their scrap paper pads and try each one. But don't just, like, do what most people do where you just, like, squiggle a line and see what you like. Like, literally try to draw the same thing four times and see which one stands out to you best. Nobody's going to judge you for it. It's an art supply store. We all get it. But yes. We shall move on. So, I am going to give myself three minutes on the clock. As a warm-up, I'm going to try to capture a quick rough of this human. I should have made sure that there was no uh, alarm audio. I'm going to have to watch that so it doesn't like blast noise at the camera. I should also point out that drawing while talking is a different skill entirely, so I will probably not be as good at this as I would in a bubble. <laughs> but you'll see I'm just kind of grabbing big pieces, big shapes, making sure I have what I need for a simple understanding of the figure. And in a moment, I will switch modes to something a little bit more detail-oriented. Now, I am a person who, unlike most artists, actually enjoys hands. So I do always like to give them a little more attention. But there I am. One minute in, this is what I have. Now, I'm going to take the side of the pencil. And for further negative space focus, just going to put in big blocks of darks kind of carving out of the space available what it looks like her face shape is. Coming in a little bit on the underside of the hair, which I'm going to redefine a little bit. Now I'm not worried about getting her features accurate. I'm not worried about making sure that things are perfectly in proportion because the point of figure drawing isn't to make this look like a convincing representation of the person that you were drawing. It is to make sure that you understand how that person fits together in a general sense. Especially since I only have one minute left at this point. So now the goal is to get the rest of everything kind of color boxed in, color boxed, uh, shadow boxed in as best as I can before that clock runs out and the pose changes. If we were in person, I don't have extended time to like keep tinkering with this if I choose. And that is what makes figure drawing so beneficial to a learning artist is that it makes sure that you have to accept the mistakes. If you get caught up trying to be perfect, trying to get every little thing right, you'll just run out of time every time. Like, there will be no world where you can successfully execute the entire perfect version of this. So you just have to get enough that it translates to a casual viewer who walks up and goes, Oh, yeah, that's a person. I can see that there's a person right there. That's a good capture of the pose that they're in. Five seconds left, I'm going to call it so that it doesn't blast in the ears. But as you can see, it's not a perfect grab, but... I'm actually kind of curious of what the... Uh, 
I might have actually gotten an almost <laughs> accurate ratio on this. I mean, if we're looking at top of her head seems to come to just above the ankle, and I clearly have about uh, six inches of her leg is lower. Um, you know, I didn't get all the folds up here by the neck. I didn't get the details of the angle. I didn't quite define that she's sitting and there's a lower level. But the point is, is that within three minutes, I was able to grab a functional capture. That's what you want. You want it to not be blatantly out of sync. Um, now that was just my warm up. On the next one, I am going to try to use a more actual technique of the ones I showed in the tutorial at the beginning, where I'm going to fully frame it, which means I'm going to give myself about 10 minutes, because with uh, having been doing this so long, my 10 to 15 minutes of a figure drawing is what most of you... Um, I mean, I would, basically, I just need to take my time to show off all the stuff, and that means that I can't trust my instincts, so I have to go back a step. So I'm going to give myself a 10-minute countdown. No, we're going to do a count up so the alarm doesn't go off and scare the damn camera. That's smarter. I'm not dumb sometimes. Uh, although I don't want to use this for that. This is not the most interesting. So I'm trying to pick the image, um, the images to tear out of the uh, magazines. I went with ones that I would grab off of Instagram also, and you'll notice that, like, I'm trying to get ones where the person isn't looking at the camera because I find those to be super tedious, and that's what most people seem to practice on when they're drawing because that's what most people post on the internet. So whenever you're going through, like, a website trying to find reference photos, I always recommend trying to find ones, even if it's, like, this one, the, the shot is dead on, but she's still looking to the left. Um... I always suggest trying to find those illustrations where the uh, subject is not locked in on the camera. Because it just it's better, it'll give you more angles, you won't be working constantly from the front. So, yeah, I think we'll use this. It's a nice simple pose. It's got enough uh, information to make a skeletal claim at the start while still using negative space. This will be good. All right. Starting my clock. Hmm. So, first things first, I'm going to do the quick skeletal grab, as outlined earlier. Shoulders. That is a very boxy torso that I've given her, but it will subtract when I go back for negative space. Looks like this is her stable foot, whereas this one's floating, so we're going to account for that later. Alright. There we go. 45 seconds on mine. Obviously, again, I have been doing this a while, so I'm going to try to catch a little bit of facial angle information. Now, that I have a nice simple frame, I'm going to go back in and try to create the silhouette around it. Think of this as like drawing the Terminator's exoskeleton before putting the skin over, if you've seen any of those movies ever, and understand the concept. So I know I have a dark patch here. Any like massive shadows I'm going to drop in that are inside the negative space, I'm going to drop in immediately because it'll help me frame up key information as I go. Uh, also, there's a clothing fold that's very dramatic here, so we'll mark that as basically a landmark on the figure. A little bit of shadowing information. Belt, that'll be defined better later. Tuck that in. The rest of this is all very loose and flowy. Grab some shoulder. Now the arms, the arms at a really bad angle here. It looks like somebody has taken it and actually like 
she's got it just high enough that it's not straight down, it's not really a, a field of a depth of view thing, so it is just awkward enough that it looks really awkward, and that's fine. I can still kind of grab that information, I just will draw a little attention to it later, and that is good because you'll notice as you try to do figure drawing that you're often going to be at an angle where it is not front on or ideal. Uh, you'll often be behind where the model has chosen to turn, especially if you're in a 360 degree space like the one we have at Trident. Um, there is a full rotation involved, so sometimes you're just flat behind them, sometimes you're off at a weird side. There's a lot of uh, foreshortening you're going to have to worry about. Um, if you're lucky enough to be in a 180 view, you get a little bit more consistency, but I never count on that. Hmm. So, grabbing just the key fabric fall there. There is almost no arm after that point. There's a bit of obscuration, which there will also be often, uh, especially if they're using like a table or chair to pose. Um, like a try and we give them a chair to pose with. Uh, so sometimes they're seating poses. Sometimes they are just um, leaning on it for support while posing in somewhat of a weird way. But often you'll get like the back of the chair that has this sort of vibe will just be complete like they'll be on the other side and you'll have full obscured everything and that's its own frustration for those unlucky enough to be there uh i am four minutes in i've got most of the important key information there is the separation of the legs that i do want to define here it looks like we're working with a low um, inseam. So I don't want to grab like super detailed uh, fabric falls right now, but I do want to make sure that I note. It's basically like trying to draw a map, like this little part here that happens just below the knee on this side. That's valuable location information that I want captured. So that when I'm comparing everything else, I know about. I know which street I'm on, and I don't get lost with these directions. Uh, you hold the, quite, the pencil quite differently to start with the skeletal sketching from other times. Can you talk a bit about the different ways you hold the pencil, please? So, um, if I'm trying to draw a ske uh, skeleton, I don't want to... Actually, it also depends on how detailed I'm trying to be and how hard or light I'm pressing. So, when I was doing this, I don't remember which way I was holding it because it was all autopilot, but... Often, I'm just trying to control very sharp lines, so I give it a little bit of space, enough that I can get a good single stroke straight line without having to, because uh, the closer to the tip you hold it, the less mobility you have. Like, that's a full sweep. This is the same full sweep. Like, my wrist motion has not changed between those two, but, like, up close, that's the same wrist motion. Um, so choking up or down is a matter of uh, how you want the length of the line to go. Um, same thing with curves. If I want a nice big curve, I'm going to hold the pencil far higher up than if here, because now here I have to do a full... Hit. My hand is doing much more work here, which means I'm also smudging more of this. Um, but then there's also... I will often hold it from the side if I'm just kind of doing uh, quick blocks of color, or if I need a really fine, really long line, because this edge of the pencil is always going to give you a very fine, very straight line, so if I know I can drag my hand evenly, this, that holding the edge instead of using the tip, the tip will blunt. The side will not blunt the same way. You just drag it straight across, and it will maintain a nice fine line the whole way through, and it's great. Um, so yeah, there's a couple different ways. Um, I'm sure there's other ways I hold the pencil. I'll try to keep a mind on that so I can explain if I switch hands. Uh, also, I will take it between, like, these three fingers if I just need to go in and do, like, the same movement over and over, because this will keep the, pay the pencil more stable. Like, here, if I keep doing the same move, the pressure might move it, but here, very little ability for the pressure to move it while I'm just, like, sweep, 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 and we're going to do a little wiggle, and then wiggle, 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 and now I have pretty consistent wiggles. Um... Yeah, I never really have focused on that. Nobody's ever asked. That is a fantastic question. 
I am very glad you brought that up, because I wouldn't have thought to mention that. Because that is also not something they blatantly teach you in art school. Like, they will teach you the thing about the edge of the pencil being really good for lines. Some teachers are good and they'll do that. But, like, holding the pencil in a way that gets you to the results you want doesn't necessarily mean you're ever going to hold it correctly or the same way twice. And practicing with different angles and uh, movements is always good. I've lost about two and a half minutes with show and tell, but I will still think I'll have this done in ten on my clock anyway, uh, which isn't terribly important here, but, you know, one of the things that people seem concerned with at uh, figure drawing is feeling like they aren't professional enough to be there, which is weird to me in actual practice because the whole point of figure drawing classes is to improve. But there is this whole weird vibe that comes in when you're like doing figure drawing at an art school or at a studio or at an officially sanctioned event where it does feel very dry and very like professional and technical and you feel like you don't belong there often. Which is exactly why I started doing these events at Trident was because I wanted a version of this kind of event that did not ostracize the people who most would benefit from attending. Um, so yeah, I always like environments where people will talk to each other while they're doing their artwork or like the model will joke with them. Um, but yeah, so basically I've, doing it, in my talking I've started to go in and do detailing, which I should not be doing yet. Um, so 60 seconds left. Uh, go in with the side of the pencil and I'm going to be boxing out like big colors, trying to capture the sense of fabric so I can see like the little tucks and drags and instead of trying to like define those with lines like here I could draw the individual lines and then fill them in but really I'm just going to go in give them a quick drag and then if I have time I will go back in and do something like that to frame it better but otherwise the important thing is that you can see that she has a figure that exists and that you have captured it most of this hand because of the angle of it is going to be in shadow technically even though that is the one downside of using magazines is that you don't get any sort of dramatic lighting at all it is literally just you know they've lit it for photography so you can see everything a lot more clearly which is fine but it doesn't help you practice um if you have the benefit like if you're using um photos on your phone or on the computer and you have any sort of like filter program or app or anything that will uh, manipulate that, blow up the contrast on it, set the lights high and the darks low. It'll give you a lot more to like help you define things in the early stages of practicing. So there's like little ripples in the fabric, so I'm going to do little things to define those. But otherwise, I'm just trying to capture these last big movements. I'm going to go in really dark here to really sell that this is a separate leg from that leg. And... Now, that is 11 minutes, even with my uh, time delay and pausing to explain things. But if I had, if this was a 12 or 15 minute, this is the phase where I would start going in being like, okay, well, let's like throw a line in here and here for pocket information, even though I can't really see one, but I want there to be one. Um, I'll go back in and like give the collar just a little bit more attention, really hit this uh, chin to neck separation with the uh, way the hair comes in. Like this is the point when you, you've got the figure down, you still have a few minutes left. That's when you start playing with details. That's when I should have came in and started in on the eyes. Throw in just a little bit of a nose. I'm not going to try to get it perfect. The lips are up at a weird angle, so we'll put those. Cut that jaw. Give her a little bit of cheekbone highlight. Hit the inside of the nose, forehead, blah. And this is when people start talking about overworking. This is probably about the limit of where I'm at. Because if I keep trying to add shadow and highlights, it's all just going to get muddy and weird. But I want the hair to be a little bit better. And if you have, like, 
15 seconds and you just want something that'll make your sketch look a little bit better. And this is like the cheapest trick in the whole book. But if you want to just look more impressive amongst other figure drawing people, say you have like 15, 30 seconds, go in and just really blacken up the space just around them. Or at least around the face. Here we have an actual like box of shadow here. So I'm just gonna create that definition right over the shoulder. So you just get this illusion of three dimensional uh, separation. It makes the rest of their features stand out a little bit better, but this is, this is pure showcasing at this point and has little to do with the actual techniques. But yeah, actually, from beginning to end, that's about the uh, the long and the short of figure drawing logic. It's just a matter of doing what you can. I will say that if you're getting things like a 60 second sketch that you have to do, because um, sometimes they'll do, at least I will, I will have people do like super short bursts things, because usually the model can strike the most awkward pose and hold it for at least 30 seconds, or 60 seconds. Um, and I don't have any really dramatic poses in this lineup because print is really bad at giving dramatic poses. But with the 60 second ones, that's really where you can just kind of go in and be like, all right, so I'm just going to do one quick thing where I'm going to like, I have 60 seconds. Okay, wait, hold on. Uh, 53, 54, 5. All right, so I'm going to go in, catch some of the uh, big face shapes and what have you. Put in all the important information. I'm 15 seconds in. So yeah, with a nice 30 second warm up, this is an easy way. You pick one small area of the person's figure. You can do this with hands, face, um, just their uh, arm. Like any part of the body that you would like to lock in on, I would just pick a small, simple section and just really lock in on it. So that way, you don't feel rushed trying to capture every little detail in such a short amount of time. It lets you do the same logic with something far more focused and central. Uh, I'm like a minute over. Or not a minute over, I'm like uh, five seconds over. But yeah, so a little bit of a quick crash sketch there. Um, trying to think what else I could go over. I kind of thought I would have more. Oh, speed, speed. I was going to specifically tell you how to get faster. <sighs> and I suppose this is as good a time as any. So I'm probably only going to, I think I had this originally scheduled for a two hour block, but that feels really long now, given how quickly this is moving. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do instructions for like another 15-20 minutes to go over speed and give you one more example of um, doing a more complete uh, figure drawing. But I think after that I'm just going to... I wish I had a way to just put up images on the screen and have people crash course themselves. Like when I thought I could just put a webcam on and record, I didn't think of it. But now because I had to use like a broadcasting software, which would technically let me put up a separate image on the screen right now, I wish I had thought to quickly grab some photos that I could use as reference or scan these in so that it would be more prominent on the screen. That would have been neat. Ah, future me will solve this should I do more of this stuff. Anyway point is, let's use what we have. We'll try to do a quick example of uh, another drawing, but we'll also explain how to improve speed. Hmm. So, uh, I don't want to use this one for that. I will use that one for like the last 
thing. I want another one I can zoom in on better. Where the hell did you go? Nope. You're on the back of this, aren't you? Alright. This will be good for time. There's less information to work with here. So this should hopefully make this an easier prospect to practice with. Stop it. <clears throat> okay. So I am going to use no timer or no intentional timer. I'm going to start a stopwatch, see how long it takes me to grab this image. So for this also, uh, yeah, let's do it as a four by four. So carve your page into quarters. Take the reference image you want to use, hopefully something simple, but you can honestly do it with anything. I'm just doing it simple for the purposes of show and tell. Um, also, that device is going to die if I do not plug it in, so give me half a second here to just attach a little cable. And there we are. All right. <sighs> Starting a stopwatch. Now I'm going to take as long as it takes at a comfortable pace. I'm not rushing. I'm not trying to do anything fancy. I am just going to try to capture enough of this person in a reasonable amount of time so that I have a starting point. Because there's a fashion focus on this, I'm instead of doing a skeleton, just doing a rough blocking of the full shapes that the clothes will create. And trying not to get caught up in any details just yet. Move at the speed that you would if you were on your own with nobody over your shoulder, nobody giving you hassle. I feel like I'm talking to myself at this point more because it's not like you're at home with a bunch of viewers who are wondering what's taking you so long. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go in, make things a little bit crisper. And now I've switched hand hold because I'm not doing lines anymore. I'm doing these little shadow blocks in the arms. Gonna do a lighter wobble just around them. Just capture a little bit of texture. Again, not trying to force it too much. It doesn't need to be perfect or accurate because this, again, is just a baseline. And we will improve speed based on what we choose to do here. always forget to talk once I hit certain points of a drawing because I forget that the whole point of this is I'm supposed to be uh, communicating, but like there's nothing to share right this second. <sighs> but as you go, you'll capture the information you decide is important and try to leave the rest behind. Um, and just let the timer run in the back. Don't worry about checking it or seeing how long it's taking you. Right now I'm at three minutes, but it may take you nine times as long, and that is entirely okay. Depends on how complex the image is that you're using. It depends on what your skill level is at, what your line confidence functions at, and, uh, you know, 
an infinite number of other how distra how many distractions you have around you. But the goal is to just have a time because after this, we're going to use that to create the information to tell us how to adjust our time goals. Because what we will do is in a few minutes, once I have this captured in a way that isn't garbage, hopefully, um, I'm going to go to the next quarter and redraw the same image. You're at the same reference, still looking at it, still using it there, but I'm going to extend the time it takes me by triple. So if it takes me five minutes, I will have 15 minutes. If it takes me 10 minutes, I will have a half hour. Well, I really did not handle that arm very well. Oh well. Point is, I got through it, and I goofed that little section there, but that doesn't matter. So that took me four and a half. Which means I'm looking at like 12 and a half minutes. So I'm going to redraw here for 12 and a half. I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to explain. So 12 and a half minutes here. I'm going to redraw the same exact thing. Have the reference here. Have the original. You can, If you're doing this on multiple pages, you don't have to have the, the first one as a point of reference. But you're just going to take three times as much time. Set an audible timer. And let it tell you when you're done. So you're not checking the time. You're not constantly like comparing yourself to the clock. But the goal is to, you know how long it took you to comfortably capture the image once. So you give yourself three times as much time. So this is, actually, this is one. That is our baseline. This is times three. That is our second step. Third step is uh, twice, uh, no, I'm sorry, to draw it again at one third the time. So divided by three. So with me having a four and a half minutes and this being like 12 and a half minutes, which I don't think is accurate. Three, nope, 13 and a half minutes. Um, that still may not be right. 12, 13, no, that's fine. Um, this one will be 1.5 minutes. And then here as the final test, you will do it at the exact same time again. And whenever I've had people do this challenge, they do something rough, but passable. This one always looks really good. This one ends up looking pretty close to this one. And then this one ends up looking pretty close to that one. Because when you're trying to learn the shapes and translate them, that is a slower process. Once you're doing it the second time, especially since you're giving yourself more time, you're absorbing more details, you're able to like really pick it apart, and you're already vaguely familiar with it. The third session um, is a rush, but because you've analyzed it once as a first pass, and then once with real dissection, this ends up being more of a triage game, where you're trying to quickly figure out what you can cut that is less important, and your brain's much better at that than at this part where you're trying to like initially translate. But then that, as a result of all that run through, the next time you draw it again with the same timeline, you have, you get a lot farther, a lot faster because it's taking you less time for your brain to translate the original information. Cause now it's familiar. Your hands gotten an idea of like what shapes it needs, how to get there quickly, quickly. And it will, if you start doing this approach with like one image a week, you're taking about 30 minutes per practice. Every time you do that, your line competence goes up, your ability to start faster goes up, like your speed overall will improve, your accuracy will improve, like it is just the best possible training any artist, casual or professional, could be doing, is to run yourself through what I call the three by three drill. Uh, three by three drill. And if nothing else, if you practice that once a week, you'll, you'll see very vast improvement no matter what level you're at. Um, but yeah, 
I think those are the three most important lessons that I have, is the, uh, the riverbed technique, so the, the quick breakdown of how to actually approach um, figure drawing, and then this skill, tool, technique, practice for uh, improving quality and speed at the same time. I don't think I have much else to provide at the moment. I am also now suddenly realizing that there is no background music playing, because again, I was expecting webcam, and I have that other program, and I could have just had music playing in the background this whole time, like a nice little soft instrumental. <sighs> the world's weird, man. Anyway, I will go through and take my time on one last figure drawing thing with uh, this image. And I will try to keep an eye on the chat in case anyone has questions, but I'm just going to do the thing. I'm not really going to chat much through it. I'm not going to try to explain too much of what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> Rest in peace, audio. Now, hopefully I'll do more of these. I also think I'm now that I have the video thing set up and I'm kind of trapped here for a few days. Um, yeah, Boston is going on a full, uh, like, entire lockdown starting at noon tomorrow. Uh, my girlfriend is essential um, to continue working and be on site when she works, because she works at a lab that is actually dealing with the virus. So she has a little bit more of a need to come and go. And I was going to stay, I was staying at her place, but I came back here so I could do this video thing. Um, and I think I'm just going to stay here for a few days and record some more tutorial stuff, uh, convey more psychology and uh, skills where creativity is involved. Make a few videos like that. Catch some footage of uh, me creating other artwork to use as time lapse over those. I think I'm going to make a like a little video series over the next week that I'm going to slowly trickle out after. But yeah, I've been putting off doing video stuff for a while, and it seems silly now that it's all set up. Uh, da -da -da. Oh well, thank you, Andrea and Sean. I am glad that you have had an enjoyable absorption here. I'm sorry that you uh, never made it to Boston as intended. Um, from Saskatoon. <laughs> if you ever are coming back to Boston, um, I don't know how you came across this channel specifically, but uh, if you are coming back, then uh, let me know if there's a figure drawing thing. I will totally conquer tickets. If there is a uh, other information you would need, like I've lived in Boston for the majority of my life. I've gone away a few years at a time to like try out other cities, but I always end up coming back and I know all the best secret places. So if you ever need any info, feel free to message me. I'm always happy to help. But uh, yeah, let's just go ahead and do another uh, a little six minutes. Yeah, I'm not even gonna time it. I'm just gonna do this at a speed I would to try to capture the gist and we'll see how quickly it goes. Now, this is my own time test. <sighs> so, now, actually, I will note this, is that I am aware that on the uh, first tutorial, I would kind of showed the skeleton first and then built the frame around it. I am actually going to build the frame first and put the skeleton inside it this time, because for some reason that makes more sense to me. Um, whenever I've tried to teach anyone that or seen any other artists use that version, they seem to struggle with it. So... Maybe it'll work for you. I just want to show that it's an option since it's my preferred method. I don't know why I've fallen into this way, but it happens. And obviously, again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, queries, complaints, throw them into chat and I'll do what I can. But overall, also, actually, if anyone has any questions about the uh, virus itself, um, Aside from the fact that I keep up with most actual peer-reviewed research, uh, and the person I'm dating works in a lab that made the um, the the vaccine that they're currently testing, uh, the one that will hopefully be ready in 18 months if everything goes well, um, feel free to uh, hit me with questions about the actual thing because I might have information. If not, I have at least properly educated myself in a 
uh, way that means I'm not guessing, speculating, or, you know, just making wild uh, concepts based on anxiety or what have you. Like, I have info that may hopefully be helpful. Um, if you've heard any, like, what are they called? Uh, myths, urban legends, stuff going around, like... I've known which ones have been actively debunked already. Like the people who were talking about how, oh yeah, just drink water every 20 minutes. It has to be warm water and it'll clear all the mucus out and then that'll help your lungs and it'll be good for you. It'll keep the virus from taking hold. And I'm like, no, that's not a thing at all. I don't know who told you that, but that is not how viruses work. Um, there's also the people who were talking about gargling with salt water will kill the bacteria in your mouth because otherwise it like stays in your throat for... Um, a few days and then moves to your lungs, which again is not true. So, gargling with salt water is a very good piece of advice for oral hygiene in general, but if you have breathed in the virus, it is not going to do anything about that. There seems to be this weird fixation that people think that the viral components are only being transmitted by, like, swallowing them somehow, or that they live in your throat and then you breathe them in slowly over time, but no, the whole reason you're not supposed to touch your face um, is because it can get in through your eyes, your nose, your mouth. It is a pretty persistent bugger. Um, but then, again, like, there are people who I know who are at home. They are completely isolated. They are not interacting with the outside world at all. And they're like, I can't stop touching my face! Oh no! And I'm like, you're not touching any surfaces. The reason you don't touch your face is because... If you touch a thing that has the virus and then touch your face, you have moved the virus to the core location where it can pick up into your body from. If you are at home, it's safe to say that if nobody in your house has the virus, then it doesn't matter if you're touching your face or not. Like, it's only an issue if you're touching the same things as someone who keeps leaving the house and touching the world is exposed to. Like, you're not, the virus isn't coming into your home, climbing onto a uh, surface, and then, you know, getting on your hand somehow. Uh, we love Boston. Andrea is extremely interested in any kind of art, and we will definitely look you up when we return, if for no other reason than to take you out for a drink. Oh, well, I appreciate that. That is a very kind thought. Um, but yeah, I am happy to play tour guide or to inform people as to what's worth your time or what's not, especially, like, if you have specific interests, sometimes what the uh, websites will inform you is not as useful. Like, we used to have something in uh, the Boston area called the Museum of Bad Art, which wouldn't come up in a lot of the proper searches, but, like, if you knew where it was, it was usually a good laugh worth your time. We have a friend, Karen, who thought the same thing. Uh... <laughs> it's always the Karens. But no, there's a lot of weird... Like it's it's the big thing where we're like, this virus is so new that there's not a lot of well-understood information. But the stuff that they do know is that, um, like, I heard one person claiming that, like, it lives on metal surfaces for up to nine days. Which, yes, it has a longer lifespan on metal and solid surfaces. Like, the more porous the surface, the quicker a bacteria tends to fall away. Um, but yeah, it, it's not going to survive a week and a half on a cold metal surface with no contact with anything warm or liquid. Like, viruses thrive in moist, warm areas. That's it. That is the... It's not that different from most things. It's just more aggressive than most things. I don't know. It's very... I get why people just have misinformation and share misinformation. I've never questioned it, like... One of the things we studied in my uh, forensic psychology education was moral panics and just the idea that people with no, who don't have enough info will absolutely um, still try to share info based on pure guesswork. Uh, how is the new Mass Art Museum? Actually, new information I don't have as much info on. Um, I Now that you're mentioning that, I did not know that Mass Art had opened its own museum. <laughs> um which is weird because I my where my dad still lives and where I grew up is literally a nine minute walk. Like I can, it's it's two train stops, which is a very short distance. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that is weird information. They have not put up much marketing 
towards that end goal. Um, Club and Clown here should be starting at Mass Art next semester if the virus gets under control by then. So hopefully they will get exposed to the museum, get uh, featured there, and then I can go check it out. Um, but yeah, that's kind of neat. But I will note that Mass Arts, uh, the entire property they own, is another two to three stops from the Museum of Fine Arts. So if you're going to be in the area anyway for one museum or the other, it is their very location convenient to each other to check out both, as is the school um, of the Museum of Fine Arts, which is just up the hill. I'm sure they have their own like micro gallery for the students there. Yeah, we have a student gallery. That does make sense. Yeah, likely closed now for sure. Like, yeah, we're open. Ah, oh, damn it. Timing. Timing is awful. <laughs> but yeah. I'm trying to think of other very useful... Oh! Like, everyone who bought up all the hand sanitizer? Not helpful. Hand sanitizer does a crap job at killing viruses. The reason why soap and water is more effective... Hand sanitizer is good for cleaning surfaces because it's it'll kill things on surfaces that they cannot cling to. So when you're washing down a metal surface using disinfectant spray or hand sanitizer things or like any sort of um, chemical wipe is very good at that because the same reason why the virus can kind of like hang out on the surface without getting lost is the same reason why giving it a bath of alcohol does a great job. Peeling it off skin where you have pores and... Uh, you know, actually, you know, cracks, crevices, what have you, is way more complicated because just putting bacterial, antibacterial stuff on you isn't actually that great at killing those things. Um, it is really great at trapping them there and, you know, making sure that they aren't, that you're not transferring them by touching them, well, by touching stuff, because, like, if you put antibacterial stuff on you and then touch a thing, you're probably going to transfer that before the virus, and that's better for everybody. But it is not protecting you very much because um, over time it'll still evaporate and then you'll still be touching your face thinking you're safe. But uh, soap is an emulsifier which the uh, me molecular components are both hydrophobic and hydrophilic so water is drawn to them and water is repelled from them. So as a result of that it will break apart things like oil that water normally can't interact with, because as it's pulling and pushing the um, water molecules themselves, it's also basically grinding up the lipids, fats, oils, and what have you. And one of the key things that protects viruses is they have a layer of fat around their cellular structure that maintains their integrity. And the second you disrupt that, they can't even attach to the correct uh, key aspects of other cells in order to um, become active. So even if there is still a viral component maintained on your skin, it is now disassembled in a way that makes it less able to actually cling to your cells and break you down. Basic soap and water. Not the antibacterial soap either, like just the normal stuff. You don't even need the antibacterial stuff. It has its own problems. Um, but yeah. But everyone's still doing the thing with the... Uh, with the antibacterial lotions and hand sanitizers and what have you. And it's useless. Absolutely useless. Um, what else? What else? Face masks. Face masks are a complete waste of anyone healthy's time. They do not protect you from wearing, uh, from catching things by breathing in. They protect you from breathing on other people if you are already sick. There is a reason why doctors who are performing surgeries will wear masks but do not put a mask on the patient who is having the surgery performed on them because the environment's already secure. The patient went in with whatever they were carrying with them at the time. The question mark is simply that once the doctors have been sanitized, the mask is there to catch anything they exhale so it doesn't get on the patient. For them to... For anyone who's, like, wearing a mask... And you're just collecting bacteria on the fronts. The second that mask moves over a little bit, or like you touch it to take it off, or you move any part of it to like scratch an itch, you've now put it on your hands in higher concentration. 
you're more likely to move it around. You're basically creating a petri dish on your face that increases the odds of it getting in your eyes or uh, getting around the edge of the mask. But if you're already sick, you're going to cough into it, and it's going to catch so much more of that than it's going to get into the actual air system. So the masks aren't terribly helpful unless you are already sick, and then it's just protecting people around you from getting sick also. But everyone panicked and bought all those, too. Such a weird thing. But yeah, just doing curls here. Which then made me sound like I'm going to the gym, which is one of the few things that I'm surprised I miss is being able to go to a gym. <laughs> there was literally one right down my hill, and I was all excited and getting used to going, and then this happened and I had to like put the whole membership on hold, and I feel like I am becoming sed uh, what's the word? sedentary? Sedentary. Non-moving, again. <laughs> Art and science with Griffin. We'll draw stuff, and I'll teach you how to hold a pencil weird ways, but at the same time, we'll go into a molecular breakdown of viral components. But no, the biggest thing that has me worried right now is the fact that uh, there have been some people reported to have caught the virus and then re-caught it after they got better. And if that's the case, one of two things has happened. Either this isn't a chickenpox scenario where once you catch it once, you're pretty much safe and you're fine to go on with the rest of your life. Um, or there are multiple strains of it out there already and you having caught one does not give you the correct immunities to protect you from other versions of it. And because of the way this stuff breaks down the wall lining of the lungs, you don't want a cumulative effect here because then you'll end up with fibrosis and that's its own problem. I've just been sort of babbling and ad-libbing now. <laughs> New show, Art and Science with Griffin. Do it! <laughs> Maybe I will. I mean, the current plan is to do um, a, like, creativity psychology mini-series on YouTube. Because with my psychology education and my artistic experience, that has been my focus of using my psychology degree, is basically mentoring other creators to get them around writer's blocks, or teach them how to brainstorm better. Um, so I'm gonna, I figure I'll put that into some small five-minute video format and see what I can make useful for the world. But, yeah. 13-minute figure drawing sketch while babbling about science. Granted, I kind of like got lazy with the legs. I didn't really do any shading down here. But anyway, for the four to five of you who have hung out through this whole thing, I very much appreciate it. And I especially appreciate the two of you who've been active in chat and Andrea, who has probably been encouraging with chat, as it were. But, uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything else useful to uh, eat up time with. I guess it was kind of uh, generous of me to think I could stretch this out to two hours. This is the one downside of being somebody who's like, straightforward, concise, and accurate when it comes to things like this, is that I don't have a way to, like, kind of BS my way into elongated timelines, or, like, stretching out a babble. Uh, two, I do believe there are two confirmed strange strains. Uh, there's already a mutation that has been noted. They do not know how widespread it is yet. Um, like, there's nobody tracking closely or accurately the differences between patients at this exact moment. So, yeah. And it's very possible that the vaccine could work for both. It may only work for one. These are the things that are problematic at the moment. Hmm. Yeah, no. I'm happy to provide something in lieu of having to cancel the actual in-person gathering. Uh, keep an eye on my Instagram at, at Griffin S. Hold on, I can write that out in big thing for people. Wow. Actually, I don't remember if I have a uh, underscore in my username. I think I might. Do, do, do. Go to my account. Yes, there is an underscore. So at, and I believe it is the same with both um, Twitter and Instagram. I just don't use Twitter very much. 
but Instagram tends to be where most of my stuff ends up, if anywhere. I also have a Facebook page, if that matters to people. I don't really use my social media as well as I should. Like, I'm not trying to become an influencer or gain followers. I just hope people trip over some useful stuff sometimes. But, yeah, I hope everyone's staying sane in their isolated little pockets of the world where, you know, more and more cities are starting to force that on people. Um... Hopefully this all blows over and we survive. Everything's cool. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop eating up time. I'm like waiting for like one other idea to present so I can be like, hey, I have another thing to uh, extend this with. But no, one hour, ten minutes. That seems like a reasonable amount of time to expect anyone to watch a thing. I think I'm going to call it. Have a good rest of your evenings. Uh, touch your face all you want if you have not interacted with the outside world. And wash your hands with normal stuff. Otherwise, just, you know, make sure that you are keeping yourself active and not letting the uh, stir craziness get to you too much. Activities like these and videos that you can follow along with are a great way to make yourself feel like you're still out and part of the world, even if you are more pocketed. So. Yeah, keep searching, find more stuff, watch things. Talk to you all later.